Today we're going to look at what happened in 1849 when a Virginia Quaker named Samuel M. Janney heard William A. Smith, president of Randolph-Macon College, Virginia, deliver what Janney called a lecture professedly on education, but chiefly in defense of slavery. He took the ground that slavery is right in itself and sanctioned by the Bible. His views being listened to by a large audience and applauded by some, I felt that it would not be right for me to let them pass without a refutation, which I published in a Leesburg newspaper. Soon after, the grand jury of this county met and presented me for publishing an article which they said was calculated to incite persons of color to make insurrection a rebellion. Historian Clement Eaton wrote in his book, Freedom of Thought in the Old South, that courts played a key role in moderating attempted crackdowns on anti-slavery advocacy. Much of the Southern legislation on seditious publications depended on the interpretation by the courts as to whether the liberty of speech and of the press was actually abridged. The evidence for the Upper South shows that the extreme laws limiting the freedom of discussion were tempered in nearly every case by giving the law its most constricted and humane interpretation. In Janney's case, writes Eaton, this charge of inciting rebellion was not technically correct and the court would not entertain the case. The grand jury then indicted him a second time for the same article on the ground that it denied that owners had rights of property in their slaves. At the trial, which occurred in June 1850, Janney made a brilliant defense. In his oral argument, he said, the longer you keep this subject before the people, the more there will be my way of thinking. In his written argument, he rested his case both on the technicalities of the law and on the great principles of constitutional liberty. Janney started with the observation that he couldn't have denied that owners had rights of property in their slaves since he was condemning the fact that they did. Eaton summarizes Janney's other three arguments as follows. The statute under which the presentment was made did not apply to the case when taken in connection with the Constitution of Virginia. The legislature could not have intended to violate the Constitution concerning the freedom of the press and of religious belief, and the statute must be construed accordingly. If the court should hold that the statute of 1848 did apply to his case, Jenny maintained that the law should be disregarded as being in palpable violation of the Constitution of Virginia. Finally, Janney reviewed the circumstances under which the article was written. A learned divine had gone through Loudoun County maintaining that slavery was right in itself and had ridiculed the Declaration of Independence. He put the question to the jury, and can it be possible that freedom of the press is so completely prostrated in Virginia that a native citizen of the county may not be permitted to answer an address thus publicly delivered in which there were maintained doctrines at variance with the sentiments of Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Patrick Henry, and all the great statesmen of Virginia? In a sense, Janney was reclaiming anti-slavery views as belonging to the real Virginia tradition, not the decadent one being espoused by Smith and the grand jury. He knew whereof he spoke being precisely the kind of minority the Virginia Constitution's religious freedom protection was intended to shield. Similarly, after secession, clergy from various denominations, including Presbyterians, Baptists, Methodists, and Episcopalians, used Southern independence as a rationale to lobby Confederate state governments to enact such reforms as recognizing slave marriages, relaxing laws, cracking down on slaves' ability to preach, assemble, and read and write. While not going as far as Janney, they were in some respects following his precedent of invoking religious freedom to criticize the peculiar institution. Shout out to a YouTube commenter on another video who serendipitously reminded me of this history when I was getting ready for this video. It figures in Paul D. Escott's What Shall We Do With the Negro? Lincoln, White Racism, and Civil War America, as well as Emory M. Thomas's The Confederacy as a Revolutionary Experience. Thomas writes, Many churchmen throughout the South exhorted their flocks to appease the wrath of God by setting their domestic institutions aright. The reform impulse bore some fruit. In April 1863, the Georgia legislature repealed a law which forbade issuing licenses to preach to black men. 
In Alabama in late 1864, the legislature enacted a law requiring masters to provide legal counsel and ensure a fair trial when their slaves were indicted for any offense. The movement to reform the slave system, although it failed to produce the results it desired, did help prepare the Confederate mind to accept far more sweeping changes to the South's social mores. Here Thomas is talking about the Confederate debate on emancipation as a war measure to address the South's growing manpower shortage. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to see a video on that topic. As for Janney, back in 1850, his memoir relates the resolution of his case. The court was composed of the magistrates of the county. Most of them were slaveholders. They concluded to quash the proceedings, and their chairman gave me a lecture upon the necessity of great care and caution in meddling with the delicate question of slavery. I cared little for his lecture and proceeded without delay to publish my answer to the presentment under the title of The Freedom of the Press Vindicated. As always, I've got additional context in a companion post at my website. If you'd like to support this growing little channel, I'd be super thankful if you clicked the super thanks button below the video. It also helps if you hit that like button, subscribe, comment with your thoughts on Samuel Janney, and share with anyone who might be interested. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.